no less than six people at your disposal, ready, willing, and able to take cues and to provide A's. It's a real time saver, by the way. <laughs> Folks, in no particular order, Craig Lapsley, you already know he has graced the stage before, but I note you are out of uniform, young man. Heaven Rock forbid. Are you headed somewhere else? Are you painting the town red or something? Yes. What? I've never seen you out of uniform, goddammit. It's disturbing. <coughs> Victoria's inaugural emergency management commissioner, as if you didn't know that already. Now, who else do we have with us? Mike Wazing. Mike, make yourself known to this audience. Say hi to Mike. <laughs> Deputy Commissioner for Emergency Management, <coughs> Volunteerism and Community Resilience within Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. Around 42,000 volunteers? Wow. That is a... Is that the largest body of volunteers that fall under the one jurisdiction, if you like, in the country? 42,000? No, I think there's a few others that... Please Surf Life Saving Victoria, <laughs> CFA. It's not about numbers, it's quality. It's right up there. It's, it's about quality. It's quality and diversity. And that sets... <laughs> That sets the tone for our discussion. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Rotarangi joins us. She's the Deputy Chief Officer with the CFA. Stephanie, please make yourself known to this crowd. Right. Joined the CFA from Delp, where she served as Chief Fire Officer since 2016. Um, a career in firefighting, decades in the making here and in New Zealand, and a PhD, no less, in community resilience. I'm a very secure person, so I don't feel any need to compete, but just in the, in the interest of transparency, I do have an associate diploma in professional writing and editing <laughs> from Holmes Glen <laughs> College of TAFE. So, you know, that's a full-time two-year course. Okay. Self-paced online, mainly, but I've got it, damn it. But look, Stephanie, you know, your input's valued as well. Okay. Andrew Coglin joins us. Make yourself known, Andrew, please. Make him welcome, folks. The National Manager, the National Manager of Emergency Services with Australian Red Cross. Again, just to summarise the entire life and career, you know, he's played a pivotal role in coordinating Australian Red Cross response to major emergency cyclone Larry, uh, the Black Saturday bushfires here, and the Queensland floods and cyclone Yaz in 2011. Michael Morgan. Michael, make yourself known to the rest of us. Hello, well, make Michael very welcome, folks. There's a lot of South Australians around. Uh, appointed Deputy Chief Officer of the South Australian Metropolitan Fire Service, the MFS, in September 2016. You joined them back in 1986, and is it true you only had one goal, and that's to reach the top, and you will not be satisfied <laughs> until you achieve that? No, I used to have that goal. He's, um, he leads the Female FF Forum, Firefighter <laughs> Forum, the Female Firefighter Forum, and joint winner of the Women and Firefighting Australasian Male Champion Award in 2016. So you're, you justify your position on the table. Virginia Nelson, make yourself known. Superintendent Virginia Nelson. Now, just a note, uh, folks. Virginia was among us yesterday out of uniform, and I think they call that undercover in your business, isn't it? That's, that's probably worth a higher rate of pay, I'm not sure. Um, Superintendent patrols at South Brisbane District in the Brisbane region. Is it true you joined the force at age 18? Yes. Wow. Think of yourself at 18. Think of your nieces and nephews and children at 18, and there you were, an officer of the law. Is that, quite seriously, is that even allowed anymore, an 18-year-old, to join the force? No. Probably. <laughs> probably for the, and it's because of her behaviour, but we won't go into that. Superintendent Virginia Nelson, um, 28 years in the service, rural, regional, metropolitan. Goodness me, that is a heck of a lot of experience. I can't do you, uh, I, I can't you know, do you justice with those introductions, but I know we're tight for time and we have many questions as well. Get your questions in early or we'll have to be cutting off. I'm going to throw this question to the entire table. What are you doing within your organisations that reflects your commitment to inclusion and diversity? Folks, over to you. No pressure, but we are judging you. Oh, look, I'll kick off if you like. Um, so, um, sorry, Steve. Uh, so, from a, uh, a, a quite a specific perspective, uh, so Queensland um, had a um, somewhat of a built burning platform, if you will, um, a few years back um, in the form of the Allison Review. Uh, many in this room would be aware of that. <coughs> and whilst it had specific recommendations uh, that are uh, associated with um, quite uh, 
archaic type behaviour, there's probably no other way to really describe it, that actually went to a whole range of other streams that are fundamentally around um, a respectful and inclusive uh, culture. And um, it would be very easy for Queensland Foreign Emergency Services to have taken just a, uh, a standard approach in terms of recommendations and gone through the almost the tick the box exercise in, say, in saying, well, yes, recommendation A, uh, B, C, D, that that was the approach that uh, you could take, and yes, we've fulfilled those requirements. But fundamentally for us, um, we've shifted from what was a burning platform to a more sustained and deliberate approach in terms of change. Um, both in terms of inclusion and diversity and culture, and ultimately everyone in this room would recognise the relationship of those. Uh, and if you will, uh, we've gone from a, uh, just not only dealing with the primary recommendations, but going to secondary and tertiary recommendations in terms of embedding some of the fundamentals that underlie and aren't necessarily called out in the Allison review itself, but fundamentally underlie in terms of what inclusive and diverse organisation that we wanted to be. Um, we've got periodic um, uh, checking points and the, in fact one of those is occurring right now and the final one of those will be in 2020 and again that's quite deliberate for us to check back in um, and have actually have external uh, people check back in about how we're progressing, where we're at um, and as everyone would appreciate ultimately when we're talking about in, in, um, inclusion and diversity it's a big wicked issue, it's not something you solve overnight. Um, and even reading some of the board uh, notes, I noticed there's been an active conversation here yesterday and again today about um, sometimes it's very easy to narrow in onto gender issues or, or specific issues around that, but it is big. And, and uh, again, in terms of the, the, if you like, the analogy of uh, what's beneath the surface in terms of the iceberg around um, what diversity actually looks like. So that's been a key aspect for the Queensland Fire Emergency Service. We've uh, as I say, both in terms of strategy, but also um, this is not just about strategy and policy setting, it's actually about investment, investment of our time, investment of our leadership. Um, and that goes to the heart of actually, uh, again, in a principal sense, walking the talk. Um, but everyone uh, in Australia, and certainly in the Minty Services, I would suggest <coughs> have a good um, metre um, in terms of uh, when, when we're not really carrying through on those, and so we've actually had to have some really deliberate checking points. We've got surveys, annual surveys, that uh, we're able to do through working for Queensland. There's a range of different checking points and measures, um, which are really important for us. What are you and checking and measuring? measuring? What are you um, checking and measuring? Right through, that's no, a great follow-up question. So we've got, uh, so this is part of whole of government approach in Queensland, in terms of uh, working for Queensland results, but we actually have a departmental aspect where you can add act extras in. Um, the, it's everything from uh, a, almost job satisfaction, if you work, if you will, through to workplace health, uh, through to um, harassment, through to all sorts of other aspects. So it's quite deliberate. Um, the first year was run for us. Uh, I think we're only about 30% in terms of returns, um, pretty ordinary returns. That's now up to 50, closer to 50%. So it's actually starting to get a true value. But it also gives you a whole lot of actually conversation uh, pieces back with your people. Again, walking the talk analogy, if you will. Um, it gives you some tangible things to say, well, this is what you've told us. And because it's not for the executive to have be the font of all knowledge and solve these sorts of things. It's actually working with our people to do that. Um, it's been a, a key enabler for us in terms of some of our change and maintaining some of the change because um, uh, we've got a long history of change uh, but very quickly you stall, you recede and then you go backwards again and so we want to really um, embed this in terms of an ongoing aspect. I'll open that up to the other members of the discussion. Your organisation, what are you doing in relation to inclusivity, diversity? Um, I might jump in. Um, we Please haven't um, been um, party of reviews, but what we are doing is we're looking at um, reviews that are taking place at Queensland, for example, other organisations, um, SAPOL, um, South Australian Police within our state. So it's, we're taking an opportunity to learn that there's, there's themes that are coming out and you, you have to reflect on your own organisation and potentially will this happen or could this happen with our within our organisation? And so you, you've got to look at that, reflect on that truthfully. So um, we're... We've engaged um, with the Equal Opportunities Commissioner in South Australia. We're doing some work around uh, the culture of the organisation. We want to increase our diversity um, in, in every aspect. 
So to do that, we're working with the Equal Opportunities Commission to develop um, strategies around um, diversity, but also programs that will, in, will assist in implementation. Uh, we've got a very strong culture, in the, uh, as, as we all do. Uh, we're 156 years old, uh, one of the oldest legislated fire services uh, in, um, in Australia and, and, and elsewhere. So you, you've got a culture within the organisation now that uh, we don't believe that our culture, we currently have, we have a good culture in, in, in a sense, but we're not sure that that culture is the one that's going to carry us through into being a more diverse and inclusive organisation. So we're doing a lot of work on, uh, on looking at ourselves with the Commission. Um, the Chief, certainly through AFAC, are involved in male champions of change. So there's, there's a lot that we're doing within our um, organisation to, um, to progress where we are currently. Uh, of course, that means you've got to engage your workforce. Um, you know, the Chief and myself as the Deputy are very keen to participate in this, but we need to ensure that uh, the next line managers and, um, the, and the coalface managers, our commanders in our organisation, are also willing to embrace that change and, and look at how we can improve um, ourselves as an organisation. So I'll just, and I mentioned it yesterday, but I'll, I'll just dwell for a moment about um, a little bit of strategy and then get to action, because I think it's about the action and the action, um, I think, is very hard sometimes to actually get that's through these organisations that are so deep in um, tradition and structure and culture. And that's not a criticism, that's a reality. So we, we've taken the approach to come up with a, a framework, a diversity and inclusion framework, which I mentioned yesterday came from what was very much the gender task force. Um, and the gender task force was something that grew out of a need from the 09 fires. Um, that in itself is absolutely fundamental. So the diversity framework has got to have a community side of it and how we connect to community as well as an organisational sector part of it. Um, quite complex uh, because this subject is actually complex. It's not easy. Um, from there, it's got an action plan and some of the actions is, uh, for example, we've had 31 of our senior executives, which are chief officers, chief executives, chief health officer, uh, all in the, in the room to talk about and be coached and understand and in a safe place be able to talk about the challenges as an individual to lead in these organisations and also uh, a safe place to be able to put new ideas that um, can be developed. And uh, that's worked and uh, Stephanie may wish to talk about Steph's been part of that um, when, she, when Steph was um, uh, the Chief of DELP. And inside there you've got CFA, MFB, DELP as the um, the public land um, environmental uh, fire controllers, Ambulance Victoria, Vic Pol, Department of Human Services, Life Saving Victoria, and it goes on. So it's, it's, it's diverse in its membership, and it has to be, because if we only deal with fire alone, we'll deal with the fire issue of a culture of fire services that's worldwide. That's not, that's not Victoria bound, that's worldwide. And what Michael just talked about is exactly what you'll see, particularly in urban fire services. Um, and then you'll have a different set of cultures in a rural fire service and you'll have a different set of cultures in what is a land management fire service. And so if we stay in the fire footprint alone, we do not get where we need to go. Now that's cost a bit because we need coaches. I am being coached by a person and so are a number of the other senior executives. And when I mean coach, we are being coached about our language, our behaviour, our approaches. Uh, and uh, some will say it's a bit of a weakness to be coached when you're a senior executive, it's not. We have to understand the issues of our workforces and we have to understand the societal issues of today, not yesterday. Uh, absolutely critical. And um, it's been a wonderful uh, experience, a challenging experience, but something that if we don't sponsor it and make the change, no one can. And when I say that, I, I mean, and you would heard me say yesterday, Steve was in the room yesterday, where's Steve today? It's not about hierarchical rank, it's about behaviours and languages and empowerment across organisations. Um, but it's also about commitment. One of the things that I worry about, and I watch some of our organisations, they'll jump on the next thing that's the best shiny thing and that'll go for 12 months and they'll jump on something else and they'll jump on And I give you, and you will all look at me and go, yeah, we'll, we've heard about that, the thick shiny thing. I talk about the emu, you know. Mm. It's where they peck away at it and then they get sick of pecking away at that and they head off to the next shiny, shiny thing. We can't do that with this. This is a diversity and inclusion commitment, and whether it's male champions of change, and I would not sign up to male champions of change as an individual. Lisa Jones is here with me. Lisa knows how hard it was for me to get signed up to that because I was, I was making a personal commitment for organisations that I knew the organisations had to change. That's hard. 
these organisations have to change. They can't continue the way they are. Everyone I've just talked about has to change and wants to change. Um, so we, we've been very strong then to sponsor people. Uh, so our Human Rights Commissioner in Victoria, exceptional individual, and we've had two of them, both exceptional. We're very close to them. We understand the issues. We share the issues. We share the uh, achievements, but we also have got the relationship to say this is actually hard and we can't get there. Um, at the moment, we're, we're actually collecting data. Unlike Mike, if Mike's been able to get to the measurement, well done, because we haven't got there yet. Uh, we are only in the place of collecting the data because a lot of these organisations do not collect the data that is meaningful about diversity, does not, do not collect the, the, the core data about what it means to be able to make a change. So if you start on the da data journey, you've got to have a really strong strategy about what it takes you to information and to knowledge and to measurement. Data will take you nowhere if you're not careful. It, it actually will confuse the discussion because it can actually, are oh, you yeah, doing pretty good in this space or whatever. You've got to be solid in me measurement and it's got to be really well structured. Um, and, and I suppose the last bit about that is um, you've got to give this thing energy and you've got to give a purpose. Now I look in this room yesterday and we are the converted. Are we good at this? I hope, I hope we are. Am I learning? Absolutely. Uh, and, I, and I'm learning every day about how we are better to be diverse and understanding and how it's a personal issue. I'll give you one example about safety. How do you make a safe place? So in your Coast Guard unit, your Red Cross unit, your CFA unit, your whatever unit, um, just stop and think about the, the language, the behaviours, the stories that are told, the narrative and how inclusive it is or is not. These are clubs. Clubs behave certain ways. I've been to places where you walk in the door and you think, I don't think I'd want to walk back. Close the door and walk away. These are volunteer and career people that sometimes are not right. <clears throat> and they don't reflect societal issue of today. So it's change. It is serious change. And it's got to be safe. And how you make a safe place, I think, is one of the biggest challenges. It's got to be safe. It's safe to talk, safe, safe to understand, safe to operate. And when, and when the pressure's on, these organisations go back to their DNA and their DNA will take you back to their culture and their culture will take you back to some behaviours that are inappropriate for tomorrow. That's the fact. And the fact I sit and talk about it can quite sometimes get criticism of other around me that are senior people and not so senior because I'm willing to say, you know what, we haven't actually got it right. And then talk about marginal groups of how they get marginalised and why they're marginal groups and how they're not included. Work that out. So I'll just give you all the complexity. And I think you've resolved this the last couple of days for us because you've got all the right answers. And we want those answers. How do you be the 17-year-old uh, person that has something different? You are different. And how do you fit into this group that's been there for 100 years? Craig, I'll, you pause you there. Take I'll, it. I'll pause you there. Other groups? Um, well, from a policing perspective, it's probably a... Um, only slightly different. We're all emergency services, but it is, if we just listen to what Craig said, it is really hard work. We are changing really deeply embedded values and behaviours, and uh, certainly from a policing organisation, we've seen from the VROC review in Victoria, the AFP review, SAPOL did their review, and Northern Territory, and the Queensland Police Service hasn't done a review. Our Commissioner has determined that the behaviours um, in relation to diversity and in particular gender, we, that we will accept that that's occurring in our organisation. And, and that's disappointing. Um, but in terms of that, we've had some significant work um, in that space and probably will continue to do that. But if I look back to um, before I was born or probably just when I was born, Commissioner Whitrod was trying to do this in the 1970s and then you have a change of leadership and it goes off the boil and then we have the Fitzgerald inquiry across Queensland and that resulted in another um, round which was about the time that I joined but was still very, um, um, very uh, small numbers of women then. But we took our eyes off the ball because if we hadn't taken our eyes off the ball, I would be one of 30% women at the senior levels in the Queensland Police Service and I'm less than 4%. So we still haven't got, um, we've recently started 50-50 recruiting, 
And with that comes a great deal of um, difficulty because there is a sense of loss when suddenly 70% of those positions or 80% are not available to men where they previously have been. So managing that as those women come into the organisation has been quite difficult and we're doing a, a lot of work in that space. But despite that, our organisation in 10 years, if we continue to recruit at that level and can attract women to come to our organisation, we will still not have reached 33%, which I know is significantly higher um, for um, than, say, for example, the fire services, but our benchmark, our starting benchmark is, uh, benchmark is significantly different. Um, so it is a really, really difficult body of leadership because our cultures, as we've heard from um, the others, um, and as Mike said, it's not going to be solved overnight. Our cultures are going to be key to us being able to, to shift this and to not, it's not just about women, it is significantly about diversity um, of a whole range of things. And for us, we really need to represent the communities that we serve because we work with them. And, uh, and in that regard, we really don't. So we're working very hard with our recruitment. But at the same time, the decision makers in our organisation still have their own um, embedded values and um, the culture that they've been in. You know, I've been in 28 years, which is a long time. They've been in, you know, 35, 40 years in policing, and uh, and as as Craig said, for him it's it's tough. So it's also very tough for women who are in the organisation to shift our values because you buy into the strength, the courage, the bravery, the toughness of your organisation. And at 18, it was pretty cool, and I thought I was buying into that. And my maturity and time in the job, and now greater understanding has seen that I need to change. And five years ago, I would not be sitting on this panel. Five years ago, if you championed women, um, you would be cast aside and not included. You know, it was quite difficult and challenging. So it's changed that much so quickly? I think so, and our leadership has been a significant part of that. Um, and probably the, um, the reviews and the other agencies, which, you know, terrible, terrible findings. Can I just add to that, I, I think some really interesting points raised there. Um, the, the change in culture is really significant. So I, I represent today an organisation that is predominantly female based, uh, as opposed to I think most of the other organisations represented out here. But we share some of the same conservative, for want of a better word, values and approaches to things. So there's just as much a change journey in that regard as what there is in terms of the makeup of who's on, on management groups and so forth. Uh, I, I can reel you off some statistics. Our uh, national executive, five of the members of the nine are female, five of our seven state directors are female, etc. Uh, likewise, we do a lot of work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups, so we have a specific target of 10% of our employees being of that background by 2020, and we're up to 9%, which we're very proud of. But that aside, I think one of the things we're really grappling with at the moment. And we've had a new CEO come in about 18 months ago, Judy Slatcher, so female CEO, which is not peculiar to Red Cross. Um, you know, that's certainly happened a lot in, historically. But one of the great things she's brought to the organisation is to challenge what we're doing and how we're doing it. And in particular, to start to think about how we engage more effectively with the communities we're working in and all the diversity that they, they bring and they represent. Not in a way that merely has us looking at quotas and so forth, but also to really reflect in the way we develop the work that we do, that we're working with them. We're not doing things to communities, we're in there working alongside. And a, a couple of examples have been talked about over the last couple of days, which I thought are really worth reflecting on. Um, Michael Aman, from our, formerly from our Adelaide office, he's now working with a local government association, talked about a framework around people at risk in emergencies. The great thing about the development of that was not that an organisation came in and did it, but I think the way in which we worked with some of those community groups and some of those people in developing that set of guidelines or that framework. Similarly, uh, we've worked side by side with ACOS in the past in developing preparedness materials for community service organisations. So I think one of the great changes that we're trying to bring to the sector is that link between what happens in the community and the community service sector and what goes on through the more traditional emergency management based organisations and I think there's a real opportunity within all of that. 
Thanks very much. So um, a lot of great stuff has already been said. Um, I'm feeling like I've got the least uh, to input here because I've only been with the CFA for two weeks, so it would be almost impossible. And you're already out of the office yeah. talking on behalf of the organisation at a fancy conference. It would be impossible you. for me to, uh, to really give a true reflection of the amount of work that's going on in our organisation. However, I am happy to give you some uh, fresh perspectives from someone who's new to the organisation. So the first thing that really strikes me is our leader's commitment to really strong and deliberate language around inclusion and fairness. And you might think that that's a little bit soft and not that hard, but I haven't heard messaging like this before from every level of our organisation, that this is something that we are committed to, thinking about every step of the way and putting into action and taking our people on a journey. So for me, I can't stress enough how refreshing it is to see a wide variety of, wide variety of people reflected not only in our messaging uh, but in our language and in our policy as well. Um, and the work that Craig was uh, referring to before, the, the collective power of 31 leaders in Victoria standing up and saying, we don't really have all the answers, we're getting some coaching here, but we want to be inclusive, fair uh, and a diverse organisation. I think that's a real mind shift that shouldn't be understated. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to talk about too is um, our organisation's commitment to creating a safe environment and really systematically removing any barriers there are in our organisational culture to making sure that everybody feels safe and included. Not by any means after two weeks do I have all the answers. Um, and as it's already been said, we've been part of the sector for a long time. If we had the answers, we probably would have done something about it by now. But a total commitment to a difficult journey. Um, one of the other things I've noticed about the CFA is a real commitment to learning from uh, our own people. Diverse organisation, lots of volunteers, career staff, uh, and really taking the opportunity for storytelling and, and learning from each other. Um, Again, it might sound a bit soft, but I think storytelling is potentially one of our most powerful um, means to really reach a tipping point where um, you know, we're all humans and we relate to human stories and they start to make sense to us and we start to make change. Um, finally, I just wanted to say, sometimes we think about this like it's just a people thing and if we're just better people, then you know, everything would be fine. But actually there's a real piece of work in all of our organisations that are related around systems, tools and processes so that we have the systems to be on interoperable, so that we have this, the tools and the processes to train our people uh, and, and so we're also doing a big piece of work in that space. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say is we have introduced inclusion and fairness councils throughout our organisation. So, you know, there's a state council and we're starting to roll out regional councils and this is just another way of hearing from our people but also allowing some really organic grassroots uh, solutions to, to evolve so we don't have to have uh, just organisational statewide or, or um, Victoria wide solutions. Learning from our people, learning from each other. Thank you. So if you talked about the power of stories and it's hard to beat the power of a story. We heard a terrific story from Sharon this afternoon, didn't we? You know, talking about her experience of family violence after aftermath of uh, disaster. Um, have you, and you also talked about the power of talking to your people, mm. have, has anybody here sort of systematised a way that your people, from the top down, meet, heaven forbid, face to face, one on one or in a group, in a human to human format, with some unusual suspects to get their various perspectives. I'll throw that to you and anyone else who wants to take that, because I dare say that that's something that could be, do, uh, could be done. Anyone doing it? I'd, I'd suggest that's a, a critical part of the work that a lot of the organisations in the room do, particularly at, in the recovery side of things, where once you know, the immediate impact of an event is over, I think the best way in which that work is done is when we get in and sit with communities and understand what communities are made up of, who they are, uh, what makes them tick, what they need and what they don't need, and really start to shape recovery programs in the longer term around what the needs and the diversity of those communities are, as opposed to coming in with a set solution, with a, a solution looking for a problem, as someone I know used to often refer to. I'm not sure I've got the um, 
I haven't got the answer for your question. What I get concerned about is when we step in what we don't see, um, or what we're not allowed to not allowed to see or not allowed to discuss. So go to the difficult things about domestic violence or family violence in emergencies, has had some level of research. Um, but I watch with interest and um, and probably it's one of those bugbears that I'll probably um, never ever resolve is what do we say? We ask people to do things, but what we're actually asked to do is take a series of actions that we, we don't necessarily have control of. And I'll, I'll use one, are we actually um, curating the potential of, a, of, a, of a, a less safe place, an unsafe place? And, and I almost reluctantly say it, but do, ha, have, we, have we collectively um, asked people to do things that almost induces in domestic um, problems leading to domestic violence? Have we done and asked people to do things that creates an unsafe family place? Now you might think it's strange to talk about that in this forum, but it needs to be talked in some forum at some point in time. And so the question you ask is yes, we, we do bring people together. I think we bring people together of like minds, <coughs> quite often. Uh, which means we've got to push ourselves out of the comfort zone to actually have other people actually have that discussion with us about what's the right and wrongs. Now, uh, the, what the question you ask and the answer I've given you are probably not that, they're not actually quite connected in the true sense. So I, I suppose I'm putting to the group, we potentially can see things that we can't control, but, or can we? Can we actually ask people to be more mindful of each other in, in times of need, in times of chaos, in times of trauma, um, that we are very mindful of these base level things that occur that we do not create more unsafe family positions uh, or put mechanisms around to try and reduce it. Um, Brett, we, um, uh, with your question, were you sort of uh, talking about within our organisations as well? Um, because. But with, with the changes we tr we're trying to bring about, it, it's, it is really important that you engage with um, with your staff. Uh, I've done that on a number of occasions, and and the challenge is typically because we're trying to change what they perceive to be the norm in the organisation and how it's been, is that often in those forums it's the vocal opponents that are the, the loudest. And so then what you get is you get the rest of the, the people within the organisation go quiet. And I had an experience just recently with one particular shift and we were talking about privacy within the station. It's an old, it's 33 years old and we have to do some modifications. But I had two or three very vocal opponents to the, um, the privacy matter. But they, they were focusing on their own wants and needs and not the, other, the rest of the people within the group. So they became very loud, very vocal. So uh, I, I guess from a leadership perspective, when you, you can, you're confronted with that, you, you have to remain strong. So I, I think they were hoping and, and, and looking for, for myself to shift my position slightly. Or, um, but, uh, so it, it's a matter of staying strong and, and, and then pro somehow giving the other people the opportunity to speak. Because um, in, in uh, fire organisations or those strong male dominated workforces, when the loud ones speak and they're absolutely opposed to what's being discussed and the rest will sit there and be quiet. Well I did want to talk to Virginia about that because, just to clarify, 50-50 recruiting? Yes. <coughs> there must have been a hell of a lot of pushback from the ranks on that. How on earth did you push them back and push it through? Well we haven't yet. Um, we're still we're still recruiting, um, or we try to recruit at 50/50. That's that's um, an aspirational goal for us. It's not always possible because our our, um, our recruit pools just don't um, stack up in that regard. And there has been some pushback. To, you know, um, the myths that get out there, such as we've lowered the standards. In fact, three months after the uh, the first 50/50 recruit group went through, we actually um, lifted the um, aptitude testing standard. Um, so none of them have been lowered, but even getting that messaging out can sometimes be very difficult. I think it's a key leadership issue for us. The leadership have to keep talking about it and they have to be committed and passionate and actually believe it themselves um, because uh, cops can see right through it if, you, uh, if they're not being real or authentic when they're trying to sell what is the uh, organisational message, they can see right through it. But I think the other part, um, just to touch on the storytelling and um, 
and the stuff that Craig was talking about, about creating that safe workplace, we're, we're members of the community too. So when we, we pop out those stats about domestic violence and sexual assault, well, if you have a look around this room, you know, people here are victims, the same as in our organisations, and creating an organisation where those people can actually ask for help has been a key part of our strategy. So it's not just around um, creating a more inclusive workplace, it's about creating a, a workplace where people can say, hey, I need help, because it's that masculinity that actually holds us back um, from asking for help or admitting that, um, you know, that job was a, a bit tough. And so that's a significant part. We've, we're moving or creating an, an extra layer, if you like, around the work we've done on inclusion and diversity um, in, the, in the mental health space. And I think that they can't be done in isolation. From the floor. There's another community that can be engaged with out there, and I'd like to follow up on what Stephanie said, and that's the volunteer community. The frontline responders who are out there are engaging with diverse communities every day, and in many cases, they themselves are that diverse community. And I think that's overlooked. The, co the volunteers aren't parachuted in from somewhere else. They're from that local community, and they often have different language <coughs> skills, different cultural backgrounds, a lot of knowledge that can be useful to organisations. So my question is, how will agencies, or do agencies, or Will agencies think about incorporating that knowledge from the volunteers so that knowledge transfer is from the bottom up as well as from the top down? Um, yeah, look, you hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, I'm pretty passionate about this environment, not just because I look after volunteers, but also being a volunteer. Um, and we don't yet adequately um, acknowledge the knowledge, skills and attributes that our uh, people bring to the table when they come in. We've got everyone from doctors, lawyers at one end of the spectrum to, um, and at the other end of the spectrum we've got people that can't read or write. But they're a value to us, they're a value to their local community and many of the people in my experience over so nearly 30 years, the ones that can't read or write are actually in many cases the local community leader because they're out and about and they're connected uh, in that, yeah, again there's that word, but um, if I use a different word, they've got relationships with the local community. They've got the relationships with the local businesses and the industries and the other, the sporting club and all the other aspects. Um, and we don't adequately acknowledge that. Um, we come in boots and all, particularly in response phases. We come in boots and all and all the flashy gear that we do, parachute in, literally. Um, and then uh, as soon as the, uh, the things are settled down, we disappear again and the local community, the local volunteers, and also the local staff, and you see this in, you see this certainly across the sector generally in terms of police and, and other services as well, and councils, they're still there. So they're feeling as much of the recovery pain um, and as uh, the community is, and yet we're not necessarily, or we're not adequately <coughs> engaged at that time, both in terms of lessons learned. Most of our lessons learned come out of our response phase. all the time. Back to Andrew's comment, what we need to be looking at is what's occurring in recovery, what's occurring to the communities, what's occurring to our people and how we actually enable that to actually build better prepared um, people and arrangements locally. And some of this is really organic and it should be organic. Um, we've got lots of rules, I could tell you. We've got thousands of rules. <laughs> Literally, we've just done the exercise, we've got thousands of rules. Um, and. Uh, it holds people back from doing what they need to do locally and they know that's right. So a ruler's got to have rules. Um, that's why the organisations are what they are. <laughs> so just, just on that comment, if I may, so Faye, that wasn't a question, that was a statement, because Faye is the, one of the most successful unit controllers of SES in Victoria because what she said happens in Footscray. Footscray membership is representative of the community that they are, and when you go there, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to the Footscray unit members because they are cross-sectional uh, and they're vertical in what they do across that, that community. Age groups, uh, nationality, race, uh, sexuality, it's all in there. It's an absolute pleasure to see. So, Faye, that wasn't a question, that was a statement because you know how it's <laughs> So the frustration Faye's got, I'll declare it for you, is the organisation doesn't know how to deal with it. Simple as that. And that's not a criticism to SES because you've matured something that represents community 
but the organisation hasn't done it. So it hits a ceiling really quick when it comes out of Footscray. Or Essendon is similar. So, and so is, so is Port Phillip, the one at St Kilda. They are representative of very diverse communities. I'll take you to the SES unit at Edenhope. It's not all that diverse, but nor is the community. When you walk around Edenhope, you don't see the same level of diversity in their community as what you do in Footscray. So they're representative of their community, but it's not as diverse, so it's not as diverse in its representation. But it's still so, reflective. It's still reflective, but then you've still got the same issue of how these organisations, these big organisations, deal with 2018 structures. They haven't even dealt with social media yet, some of these organisations, how to deal with it. So, so, you know, you work it through. That's not a criticism, that's reality. That's the challenge of these organisations. So, Faye, I couldn't let you get away with that. That wasn't a question. That was an absolute ripper statement. <laughs> I, I'd add equally, I, I see it as a statement, not a question, and a really valid one. And I think it's a challenge for all of the organisations in the room, probably, some more than others, is to get volunteers into those leadership roles. And it's one that we're certainly grappling with as an organisation. And I look at our counterparts in America, the American Red Cross, where everyone in their emergency service program, for every staff member who's in a management type role or leadership type role, they have an equivalent volunteer operator. And that works really well. It's obviously at a different scale to what we do here in Australia, but it's something I think to aspire to. From the floor. Hi, uh, my name is Fiona, I'm from the CFA, I'm a volunteer firefighter and I apologise to the greater audience because obviously my perspective is very CFA focused. Um, but I was struck by a couple of things that Craig said at the start. Firstly, that he is undertaking training in this. I think congratulations, that's <coughs> fabulous and that shows really excellent leadership so I hope the broader audience is aware of that. Um, but secondly, you talked about cultures in units, not just CFA, but others, reverting back to their DNA when times get tough. And I think, um, you know, DNA is created at conception. And when do we conceive people? Well, when, we, when they join, when they, they join our organisation as new recruits. Um, and so I guess everybody sitting here obviously understands the power of education. So education is a huge key to changing culture. Um, and again, I'm speaking from the CFA perspective, but our basic training in CFA, our minimum skills training, is based largely on the uh, training.gov.au community or public safety packages. And just as you were speaking, I jumped onto the, the training.gov.au website. And in fact, they have a unit of competency called work with equity and diversity and it's described as a unit that um, requires members to recognize individual differences in the workplace to value these differences and to adjust their behavior to account for these differences so my question is we have a unit of competency there it's it's a government one it's national it's just like all the other ones can we have this in minimum skills please so i <laughs> I reckon Paul, um, Stephanie's about to make her first policy position <laughs> publicly for CFA. Steph, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and thank you, Fiona. It's, 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 um, it's really interesting pick up, and, and the comment goes, as you've already stated, much broader than the CFA. Um, one of the things we are doing is rolling out what we're calling a matter of respect program to all CFA personnel. Um, but you've raised an interesting point where we're capturing it retrospectively, there's also unit standards out there. And as a sector, as communities, we're on quite different parts of the journey here. So I'll take it a little bit further. I think um, rolling out our matter of respect training is, is um, a big step for us. It's a symbolic step <coughs> and it's an important step. But I really um, will put the question to the rest of the panel too. How do we respectfully learn from each other's journeys um, in a safe way when we're all on different parts of that journey and different parts of acceptance and dealing with uh, long-standing cultures. So I'll put that out to the rest of the panel because I think essentially that's what um, you've spent your last two days thinking about as well. But you know it's interesting we can do training and we've talked about storytelling and they're really powerful because they set, uh, set the scene and they're human but you know sometimes I think too we need a bit of a hand in listening and understanding and interpreting as well. So there are a lot of different aspects to this that we can keep on working on. Can I be a cynic for a moment? Hands up here who studied long division as part of their education. <laughs> All right, 
keep your hands up if you can do long division. <laughs> I don't believe you for a start. You are lying. My point being, of course, you can learn something in theory, but then can you put it into practice when it's time to long divide something, whatever the hell that even means. And that's how do you make that training stick, that so unit stick? The reason that we don't do long division anymore is we've got calculators and other systems and tools and processes to, to do it more effectively. And I think, isn't that our utopia? That we're not actually rolling out a matter of respect training and celebrating that, that it's so much part of our next generation or, or our thinking that we don't actually have to think about how to do it anymore. Yep. Um, it's embedded in everything that we do. Hi, my name's Emma Calgar and I'm from the University of Sydney. Um, thank you so much um, to the panel. Um, something that struck me though, if you look behind you, um, the screen does say Australian Emergency Services and Community Organisations. And we haven't seen representatives from all the states. And so I wanted to know, as organisations, if we're talking about inclusivity and diversity across Australia, how are lessons learned across your organisations in different states so that we have a national discussion about diversity and inclusivity? Thank you. <laughs> a small outbreak of spontaneous applause. <laughs> You got them going wild. How do you spread the wisdom and how do you adopt best practice faster? Because there's often a very long tail on all of this stuff. We want the, everyone to get smart and good fast. I'd, I'd respond to that just by saying we're a nationally based organisation. So in some ways we're slightly ahead of the game in that regard. So observations, etc., out of the discussions the last couple of days, we will certainly share across the country. Uh, but that's by dint of the makeup of the organisation more than anything. Yep. Um, I think it's fair, Im, very, fairly immature in process. Um, so we've got organisations that are peak bodies, so AFAC, which is representative of fire and SES organisations across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and it's only been really on the agenda for them in the last 18 months to two years, I think it's fair to say, if I look across the panel. Mm -hmm. um, then you go to commissioners and chief officers across the nation. Uh, only been the last 12 months that it's had a, a platform of any significance. Um, so why is that? I think organisations have, have had to grapple with it as organisations, jurisdictions have had to grapple with it, uh, but it's now also, um, I think, seen by government and society that these organisations need to be at the front of it. And I, I can probably be described sometimes as a bit of a cynic, but. Um, uh, you know, there are in entrenched issues in culture that need to be dealt with of significance. And what Fiona asked before, that question is not a simple answer, but it's an absolute need to address. If you're not changing the way you, you, you recruit and you're not changing the entry point, you're not changing nothing. And I mean nothing. And these, these organisations are going backwards if they don't do it. And, and I think the data we're collecting will show that that these organisations are backwards and not forward looking because of these sites of these types of issues because not long if they're not addressed you won't be representing the societal norm at all at all that's how that's how gloomy i can paint the story and i hope i'm on the wrong side of the scale when i paint it that way i hope i'm wrong i hope i'm wrong by a long way can, can I just add something to that? It, um, it, nationally, we do share through AFAC and, and working, separate working groups, but I think um, we also, uh, each of us, face challenges industrially. Now, uh, you know, from, uh, we have got a new United Firefighters Union of Australia, and each state we have different bodies, and each of us are in slightly different places industrially. But the, sometimes the challenge comes from the industrial side of the organisation, or not our organisation, but the industrial body. So for us, what we've been actively trying to do is work with the, the UFU in South Australia and bring them along. You know, it's almost, you know, not coercing, but we're, we're almost having to sell to them as well as people within the organisation of the benefit. Um, and so if you don't explain to them, you can go down a path and think you've, you're creating this fantastic way to increase your diversity, and as soon as, soon as you go to apply it, it industrially gets stopped. So then you go through a whole challenge and then you start to lose the workforce because the workforce, the, the, the louder ones in the organisation, 
basically became, CEO told you so, it's not going to work because they're, they're weakening or they're changing or they're diverting. So the, the challenge also is industrially for us. Good distinction to make. From the floor. Could I, could I go a little bit further? And Because uh, you're right, Mike. Um, and some of this is related to the impetus of change. Um, and I mentioned before the burning platform we had in Queensland and how we've deliberately leave it off that for longer term sustained change, both and beyond just, um, uh, or both culturally, but also into inclusion and diversity aspects of our workforce, and we've got a long, long way to go yet. Um, uh, but part of that is because of our reputation. So as emergency services particularly, we have a very sound re reputation within communities. Um, and that sounds really great, and, and we hold that close as a, as a, uh, uh, as a um, uh, as an entity, if you like, in terms of that's really important for us to be able to um, work with communities and, and uh, be allowed in the front door and onto properties and all the other things before, during and after disasters and, and have that trust, but also sometimes holds us back because we're not having the true conversation of actually, well, why do you need to change? So the authorised environment or the industrial environment that we operate in says, well, why do you need to change? Um, uh, we know within Queensland we, we've got uh, some internal, I call them minor adjustments if you like in some respects, but because we've been recently successful again in a response context of recent disasters have been a collective because of Queensland Fire Emergency Service, we've got the Fire Rescue, Rural Fire and SES, uh, our disaster management people and a public service all in one department um, and a uh, uh, single commission and straight to our own uh, minister. Um, there's a in authorising environment, say, well, don't change anything. There's a low risk appetite, don't change because you're doing okay. And we're going, no, we need to change. So you've got to kind of um, be, uh, and this goes to the heart of innovation, and then this is kind of chicken egg to be, you want to be more diverse so you can be more innovative. Um, that's not There's an probably less votes in diversity than in a happy union. Two points from the floor. <laughs> no, that, that's a fact, isn't it? Election year, you're a minister, you're a premier, you want a smooth running emergency service, you probably don't want industrial drama. Point. Yeah, good afternoon, my name's Simone. I'm with um, the Department of Fire and Emergency Services in Western Australia. Um, I've been privileged to be an operational firefighter for nearly 20 years, so I was one of the first females in Western Australia. Um, my comments or questions go back to your um, comments with 50-50 recruitment. So congratulations to Queensland Police for actually being able to do that. Um, I have a couple of well, problems with it. Um, do you think that 50-50, um, we don't actually have 50% applicants being females? So do you now think that it's positive discrimination maybe against the men? Do you think maybe we are setting up some of our females to fail? Um, within this organisation, um, and do you think that we actually need to go back to education to solve this problem? So maybe we need to go back to grassroots and actually educate our children from a young age that men don't have to be doctors and women nurses and women teachers and men firefighters. If we can go back to grassroots, maybe we don't need to have such a knee-jerk reaction um, to try and entice the wrong people into the job. Because I can honestly say in 20 years I've barely had any of my girlfriends say they want to do what I want to do. Because it, it's not innately in our DNA. It um, doesn't mean we can't do it. And those that do it, most of us do it very well. But do you think we should actually go back to um, community education and start with, our, with, with the girls in primary school? Um, just a couple, there's a couple of questions in there, so um, a couple of answers. I don't, um, it's not positive discrimination, it's actually about, we, we found that our recruiting was skewed toward men, um, so we've made some changes in that recruiting space, um, and we, we don't have a 50% pool to recruit from that are women. Um, having said that, we're like um, a lot of other agencies, we've um, got new strategies that do in increase the number of women that are in our, our applicant pool. We have about 10,000 applicants for about 200 positions a year. So we can afford to be very picky in terms of the police that we're recruiting. So I don't think we're setting them up for fail. It's not, um, it's not a policy. It's, um, it's an aspirational goal that the, the Commissioner and our leadership group um, have set. 
because we know that we need that. It is a capability issue for us now and into the future. And uh, in relation to going back to community grassroots education, I think that links uh, quite a lot to the language that we've been talking about, uh, to what we see in the media. I've sat here for two days and I've heard the term policeman and fireman a number of times. Um, and yet we're all working in that space and we do have to, um, you know, we've all got biases. Um, it's about us being aware of those biases and then managing them um, in our workplaces and with our people. And we know that the research tells us that by the time our young girls are eight, they are starting to preference what are traditionally uh, female jobs. And um, certainly I offered to purchase, this is a, a personal example, my, I was buying all my nieces and nephews their, um, their Christmas presents and I wanted to get Lego and one of the girls said, oh no, I don't want Lego and she wanted a Barbie and I said, no, they have pink Lego, you know, so immediately I've gone to the pink flavour but I was trying to get them all the same present. So she, you know, even though they had, oh yeah, okay, she's never played with the pink Lego um, but that was what I was used to because I've only got boys. So we have, we've brought our entire life experiences with us and we're all decision makers now in our organisations. And so being aware of what our own biases are will help us educate our children, work with our communities, work with our schools and, and things like that. So hopefully that answers your question. It's a, a really good point. I think um, uh, the language and then the images that are used, and particularly around firemen, policemen, um, and so there's a lot of, it, like social media, there's a, 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 you know, a lot of work trying to be done around changing, just saying firefighter, for example. And so um, there's a, a terrific um, video clip that's called Inspiring the Future, um, Redraw, the, uh, Redraw the Balance. And there's, um, it's in the UK, there's a firefighter, a fighter pilot and a surgeon. And so the, the, the three people are talking to the kids in the class there. I'm not sure of the age, but they're very young. And so they're asked to draw a firefighter, a police, um, sorry, a firefighter, a pilot and a surgeon. And then after they've done the drawings, I think of 60-odd drawings, five drew the three as females. The rest were drawn as, as men and they were named, all boys' names and so on. Then the three walked in and all three of them were, the, the, were women. So the kids were just shocked. Like, you know, and it's a fantastic clip. But it, I think what it does, it, it underlines some of the challenges that, you, that you've put. So you know, we've, the images that we've used previously for firefighters have been around strength. And, and physicality uh, and, and we've spoken before if you look at the firefighter calendar I can guarantee you that 99% of our workforce does not look like that so if you if you think well they're wearing uniforms for a start so, <laughs> not naked from so the if you think up. oh my god there's a fire call thank god for that I'm going to see a calendar uh, you know, <laughs> firefighter you'll be so sadly disappointed <laughs> so I think imagery language um, and again about promoting that being a firefighter or an emergency service worker or a rescue worker is something that anyone can do. If you're passionate about it, um, and, and as you said, you're probably one of the first female firefighters you've been in for 20 years. Um, our female firefighters that we have, they're just amazing. They're so passionate. They, they absolutely want to be there. And, and if I could, and, and if I could duplicate it somehow, I'd, I'd take 200 of them straight away and, and, and bring them into the organisation because it's critical. Because at the moment, we're so weak in our numbers that you know, it does, the chief often says, the chief will say, you know, it feels like you're walking in molasses and sometimes it, it does. Um, so I think language is, is absolutely critical. The language that we use as organisations, the way we promote. So we won't put any imagery out now about the uh, MFS that doesn't um, take into consideration diversity and uh, around gender and also inclusion. So we're trying to focus on also the language. And engaging with um, school kids, uh, we're engaging with uh, Netball SA, uh, cricket, um, AFLW sides, local football sides <coughs> and young groups. We're just developing a, a, a fit for firefighter type um, presentation and to explain what it is to be a firefighter. And lifting heavy things is one of the smallest things you, you need it, to be um, you know, a, a great communicator, empathetic, you know, engaging, they're the things we're looking for. So if you can lift heavy things, you know, it's probably not the job for you now. When we joined, we just followed, when I joined 33 years ago, you followed orders. You know, we're all little robots and we just followed orders today. 
Yeah, and, and we retreated into our fire stations as quickly as we possibly could. They were like fortresses, and they still are. But you went, you, you stayed in the fortress, the bells dropped, you went out, did as much as you could, as quickly as you possibly could, hope like God no one asked you a question about anything, and then retreat back into your <laughs> fortress, close it back up, and there's, so there's this mystique about it all. And so we have to break all that down and, and show what it is to be a firefighter, and it's so much more than firefighting. Stephanie, do you have a um, contribution? Maybe to close this, I'm afraid. Okay, Time's so against us. Um, Simone, firstly, thank you uh, for the question. It really is um, a question I could talk a long time on, but I know we're short on time. Um, and also congratulations on the role and the role modelling that you've done throughout your career. Um, there's just two points that I want to make, uh, acknowledging that time is quite short, and they're both a little provocative, but this is the right group to be thinking about it. So um, it's not just our own people that have a stereotype as to what a firefighter should be, but there's also a significant uh, number of members of the community that have that stereotype in their head as well. And so if you happen to be challenging that stereotype on the worst day of somebody's lives, the community's not always ready to accept uh, a female leader either. So the sort of education that you're talking about is not just good for us as agencies, but it's good for us uh, going forward uh, and those of us who are in the agencies uh, representing. Um, so confronting the general community stereotype as to what an emergency service uh, worker should look like will have knock-on effects for all of us. Sorry, that was a bit rushed. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about too is probably one of our biggest challenges and it goes beyond recruitment uh, in my mind. To be clear, um, I'm talking about New Zealand so that's okay, shouldn't offend anybody here. But um, Oh, they're the among us. Oh. Anyways, yeah, they are. They're scattered around. Uh, so how about Taking that, our job. How about that rugby? But um, <laughs> what I really wanted to say was we can be very successful at recruiting, and some organisations have shown that, but we are still not successful at retaining. Um, now, I happen to believe that women have always been strong leaders, as have many other minority groups, traditional owners and likewise, just not used to doing it from a position of power. So our organisations are very hierarchical and power structured. So in, until we actually start addressing that, we will get women, we will get other diverse groups and they will leave. So that's something for you guys to solve, which will be fantastic. Thank you. They'll report back next year in this room. <laughs> Please thank all of our panellists for their honesty, for their self-reflection. Mike, Stephanie, Craig, Andrew, Michael and Virginia. Panellists, I will release you back into the wild whilst we wrap up diversity in disaster 2018. Thanks, panellists. Thanks for all the contributions, by the way, today and yesterday as well.